Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. G'day, g'day. How's it going? What do you know? Striker like Clayton here from XY Advisor uh, chatting with Christopher Joy. Mate, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, yeah. So when you're not saving shark, or, or I should say surfers from sharks with your amateur droning, uh, what are you doing? Yeah, so I run Coolabar Capital um, and we run about $4.5 billion in uh, fixed income. We're an active credit manager. Um, it's an interesting business. I've got 23 staff, 11 analysts, um, about uh, five portfolio managers uh, spread between Sydney and Melbourne. I'm about to open up a London office. And we offer um, a range of mainly Insta, but also um, retail products. So uh, we run the beta shares active HBRD ETF product, yes, uh, which is the fastest growing uh, ETF, active ETF in Australia. And then we have... Um, three different retail um, solutions in the fixed income space. Um, I'm also a contributing editor with the AFR. So I write a weekly column uh, on all manner of stuff. So, you know, economics, finance, housing, politics, national security. And then as you mentioned, I'm also a, uh, uh, well, I've been described in the global media as a, <clears throat> amateur yeah. drone pilot. I don't think I'm so amateur. I think my drone's pretty fancy. It's got night vision, thermal imaging, an emergency speaker system. Yeah, that was the crazy part, that, yeah. it, that you could speak to the surfer, right? Yeah, well, I actually think it's the – I believe it's the first recorded case in human history where <laughs> a drone has actually um, spoken to a surfer and helped prevent a shark attack. Look, as a former surfer, and it would be sacrilegious to call myself a surfer at this stage in my life, but as a former surfer, the fact that that is even an option gives me, makes my 16-year-old self feel so much safer in the water. I wish this stuff was everywhere. Yeah. So, we do actually have a YouTube website. Uh, if you're listening and you're wondering what the heck are these guys talking about, <laughs> I thought we were going to talk about you know, LICs and LITs. <laughs> so, if you Google, um, I think it's uh, Coolabar Capital in YouTube. We have the Call of Our Capital Search and Rescue Drone uh, YouTube page. And <clears throat> I have quite a few videos up there, including the famous video um, that went viral around the world. It was covered by CNN, BBC, Fox News, Channel 7, Sunrise, um, where you can see this big you know, three, four-meter shark heading for a surfer. A great white, right? <clears throat> I think it was definitely a bronze whaler or a juvenile great white. Right, okay. I think it was um, maybe a juvenile great white. Um, they're actually quite hard to tell the difference. If you're underwater, they look very different. But from above, a bronze, bronzy and a great white look very similar. Right. Um, they're both pretty dangerous. Um, yeah, bron of bronzies course. are very nippy. Yeah. <clears throat> and there have been fatalities. Um, when you see the video, what you, you got to look at it very carefully because actually, unfortunately, the quality is not great. But basically, you see a guy sitting on a longboard and the shark had been circling him. And I was quite a ways away and I saw it out of the corner of my eye because I have a live video feed on mm. the remote and I pre-recorded a shark alert <clears throat> on the speaker system um, which basically there's actually a video that you can see with the shark alert which says shark 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 evacuate the water immediately and the shark had been circling the guy and then it came in on what looked like an attack vector yeah um, it went straight for him right? straight for him yeah and if you watch the video very carefully, you can see he's sitting on the longboard and then <clears throat> you'll see the white of his face looking into the sky and straight after he does that, he spins the board around suddenly and that movement of him spinning the board suddenly freaked the shark out because I think the shark thought it had the element of surprise Yeah, and then the shark gets spooked and bolts out to sea. Oh, <clears throat> man, that is uh, like... 
That's crazy. So is that your voice going shark, 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 get out of the water? Yeah, it is. So, <laughs> and it's not, it's a, this is an emergency um, search and rescue drone. So you can actually hear the voice from half a kilometer away. It's not, it freaked the, it freaked the living daylights out of, I don't know if we can swear. Can we yeah, swear? go for it. Yeah, it freaked the fuck out of the guy. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> one thing I've learned though for surfers and swimmers is, is I've seen that many sharks come up to within a few meters of swimmers and they have no idea. And your field of vision oh. is actually much more limited than you realize. No, I fully realize it. And I hate that reality. <laughs> Back in the day when I would sit on boards, I'd be like, I, I-, I just don't know. Um, and uh, it really is the only sport in existence where there's monsters waiting to eat you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And there's also, unfortunately, many more sharks in the water than you realize. Yeah, it sucks. So, um, <laughs> I got a lot of yeah positive feedback um, on, on that video. I mean, it was just insane. It went global. No, and BBC contacted me and said <coughs> that they um they're doing a TV series on real life heroes and they wanted to do an entire yes! episode on that. But I I, I said no because you know, I'm just a very modest below the radar <laughs> fund manager. That's not the public perception of me, unfortunately. Yeah, I was but- about to say, wait a second, wait a second, because uh, I've been following your work more so on the, uh, on to do with the <laughs> AFR, certainly recently around the um, the LIC commissions more than any, more than anything else. Um, but obviously, you mentioned before you do talk about a bunch of stuff, including property prices, which I saw you think that potentially is going to go up in the uh, short term. Um, but on to the, I guess, the most important topic from an advisor's point of view is the idea that we had FOFA, right, as you're well aware, um, in commissions were, ta- were removed from investment products and super products. And I actually thought that was a really, really, really good idea. And I'm not sure how you feel about grandfathering, but I didn't really so much mind grandfathering as well because it gave a, a transition out and a clear direction forward and i sort of looked at that uh and you know i I never actually spent a day in my career being able to provide a a product that did pay although i had uh, grandfathered clients i was i was never able to quote unquote sell a, a commission paying product investment super then uh i thought that was the end of the story and for the last literally 2013 so the last sort of seven almost eight years now i've just assumed that was the the way things worked and then some stuff about magellan came out and not paying and then you started sort of having a lot to say on this and it dawned on me that and 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 since reading your work that in 2014 i believe it was the coalition that scoped out lic's as a methodology to still pay commissions that blew my mind i just thought uh all you've done is skewed flows into that uh vehicle for investment if 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 now i mean just human nature being human nature if and and let's not go into the too much technicalities here between uh, etfs and lic's but let's just assume at the moment it's trading exactly at net value right so you've got two uh, vehicles that, that have almost that would have the exact same uh, investment inside of it, but one pays the advisor money. It's just, just you don't need to be a bad person in order to see that that would be the behaviour that you're influencing, and that I feel like that you've made that exceptionally clear. Yeah. Um, what on what on earth is the counter argument to that? Well, I think the um, what's interesting is to think about how this happened because a lot of advisors have said to me what you just said, which is like, I didn't even know you could do this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's a small minority. It's really brokers um, who have transitioned to become advisors who are clipping the ticket here. And um, I think FOFA was fantastic for the industry in terms of aligning advisors to clients. And as a fund manager, I see it. Every day I speak to advisors and they rip me a new asshole. They want to crush my fees. Um, you know, generally advisors don't treat managers particularly well. <laughs> um, but that's good. You know, there's yeah. that natural competitive tension. Totally. Um, and they want the best solution for their clients. And I would say 99% of the advisors I come across are smart, hardworking. <clears throat> and it's always the case that unfortunately they get tarnished 
um, by this tiny, wincy minority. Yes. And, um, you know, of course, the vested interests, the LICs, the fund managers, and the conflicted advisors have tried to smash me when I put this onto the, the table uh, last year. But I've been writing about this since 2014. Right. Yeah. So um, when the coalition came to power, Matthias Cormann in 2014 tried to basically all but eviscerate or get rid of the best interest duty. And the other thing he tried to do, which was the main game, was he wanted in-house planners to be able to be paid sales benefit bonuses for recommending in-house product. So he proposed, yeah, you, you raise your eyebrows, you know, with the benefit of hindsight and the Royal Commission and everything we know today. I mean, that just seems like craziness. <clears throat> um, and so I more or less waged war in 2014. No acts, no conflict. You know, uh, it was simply that we have moved into a world where advisors are independent. They're being paid by their clients. Uh, it's working well. Business models have evolved. <clears throat> Why would you want to give the vertically integrated instos this huge advantage? And it was clear to me that it would corrupt advice. So I wrote like, I don't know how many, but I'm guessing 10, 20 columns in 2014 on this. <clears throat> and Corman proposed um, these uh, new laws, but they were rejected by the Senate. And they were only rejected in the end by one vote. And that senator actually cited my columns in the AFR. And Corman hated it. Um, what I didn't know was that he actually did, however, uh, agree some changes to FOFA. <clears throat> this with, is the senator? Yeah. Uh, no, no. This is – Seb. so what, after they lost the FOFA battle yes. in 2014, yep. uh, Corman, subsequent to that point, agreed some legislative changes right. um, that Labor also agreed to. And one of the things he snuck through that I missed and everyone missed was that if you have a listed investment entity, <clears throat> you are completely exempted from FOFA's ban on conflicted commissions. So, you know, on the one hand, you've got listed funds, be it a listed investment trust, which is no different to an unlisted investment trust uh, or a listed investment company, and they can pay unlimited commissions. And then, <laughs> and, and then on the other hand, you've got obviously ETFs and unlisted funds that are obviously um, you know, heavily constrained by FIFA. And that world's worked well. I mean, it's worked well for managers and advisors. <clears throat> and what we've seen is an explosion, naturally. You know, Charlie Munger, uh, Warren Buffett's partner, says, show me an incentive and I'll show you an outcome. Oh, totally. Or if you don't like the capitalists, go to Paul Keating, who says, uh, I always back the horse called self-interest, right? <laughs> and, and so naturally the LIC, LITX sector, since... 2014 has more than doubled in size to $52 billion. Yeah. And uh, on our numbers, fund managers have paid advisors about $440 million in commissions since the end of 2016 to push funds on the ASX. And we're not talking about cash funds. <clears throat> we're not talking about simple products. Most of the recent products have been hedge funds, levered hedge funds, or global high yield or sub-investment grade or junk bond funds. Now, the, the high-yield managers say, oh, we don't like the term junk. But if you Google junk bonds into Google News, you'll see that everyone in the world refers to high-yield as junk. That's like all the headlines will say, junk this, junk that. And um, <clears throat> it's not that these – I have no problem with LICs and LITs. I've been offered – so one of the things uh -huh. one of the things vested interests have said is, oh, Chris Joy, you know, every time I get involved in a policy debate, and I've advised three or four different prime ministers, I've been involved in policy debates for 25 years. And I've, you know, I'm pretty well known for taking really tough lines on controversial subjects, often when it's not in my interests. Um, <clears throat> but firstly, just on my conflicts, because you know, you're offline, you ask me that question. Um, we've been offered the opportunity to do LICs repeatedly. One of the biggest brokers approached us in December to do one. My biggest shareholder is Pinnacle, so they own 25% of Coolabar, and they're one of the biggest LIC. Um, offer, you know, offerers or promoters in the country through Antipodes, Metrics, Sferia, <clears throat> and Plato. The listed market is very important. Brokers are important. They're a big part of my distribution channel. So pissing off those guys, I mean, I've lost clients. I've been threatened um, repeatedly by both fund managers and by advisors who are taking brokerage and commissions. Um, and you know, we're, we're running the fastest growing active ETF in Australia through the listed channel. So we have a proven ability <clears throat> to raise listed capital. I'm doing this because, um, actually it would be much easier for me not to talk out 
And not to piss people off. Well, considering your involvement in Pinnacle, yeah. Correct. Um, I'm doing this because I actually really care. I care about advisors. I think advisors have got a really tough rap through the Royal Commission. 100%. Yeah, you know, through all the scandals. And it, it pains me that all the advisors I meet every day, my next door neighbor's an advisor. I literally speak to <clears throat> advisors probably three, four times a day. I mean, 99% are hardworking, ethical, only really care about their clients. They're smart. They're drowning in regulation. And now they've got to deal with this. And the problem is there's many really insidious dysfunctions. For advisors, the broker advisors who are taking commissions, because they're earning so much through commissions, they can slash their fees. So they are going to start winning more and more market share from all the folks listening to this podcast because they can effectively give advice away for free, charge bugger all, because they're earning such massive commissions from the fund managers. Um, you know, the two LITs that have been la- announced this year in January alone, two new LITs, I won't name them, they're paying total fees of $30 million to advisors and brokers to raise $1.4 billion, right? That's big money. So everyone else is going to be, at a, the uh, unconflicted advisors are going to be at a huge competitive disadvantage because they can't cut their fees. In fact, you know, they're struggling to make ends meet just on the current fee structures. Yeah, the idea of cutting fees at the moment is outrageous. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's huge problem number one. You create this massive competitive dysfunction where eventually a lot of advisors are going to bite the bullet and start taking commissions like the bad old days just to compete with the you know conflicted advisors. The second problem is the fund managers. The fund managers like me who are electing um, not to pay advisors' fees – uh, and not to do LICs and LITs, we're all going to be forced into the ASX <clears throat> and we're all going to be forced to do this eventually if they don't close the loophole, if they don't put LICs and LITs back into FOFA because it's way too commercially attractive and all of our, all my peers are raising money on the ASX and it's super high margin money, it's high fee money and it's permanent capital. Totally. Because you can't redeem from an LIC or LIT, it's closed in. Yep. So <clears throat> there's only so much money out there um, and eventually if... You know, all of our peers are uh, capturing market share. You know, we'll we'll all be ultimately forced to fold. So the competitive problems this creates uh, are profound. The most important issue is, of course, consumers. You just can't tell me. I mean, take the Partners Group <clears throat> Global High Yield Fund that launched on the ASX last year, the LIT. I mean, I, I was told they got $1.5 billion of bids in like a few days. I think they issued, you know, uh, about six hundred million. Um, now, this is a group that has no retail brand in Australia. That's marketing a global high yield fund that's two times levered. Now, you know, I mean, if a new brand came to the market through a FIFA channel, an unlisted fund, or an ETF, with no real brand salience at all in Australia, and offered advisors a fifty percent geared or two times levered. Um, a uh, junk bond fund, or uh, let's put it, you know, in in the terms that they like, so a global high yield and loan fund. I mean, h- how long would it take to raise one and a half billion? Oh. Years. I mean, I would say ten years, if ever. Correct. Yeah, and and the the manager would go through the same process I go through every day. You got to get ratings. You got to get onto APLs. You got to get onto platforms. So and so they have <laughs> avoided needing to get ratings. And needed to try to get onto platforms simply by paying commission. Well, yeah. So they don't need to go onto platforms because they're on the ASX. Yep. Um, and then they'll find friendly researchers that uh, will rate them very quickly. Yep. Um, and uh, that are paid a lot of money to do so. Um, now, to be clear, I want to make one point um, absolutely unambiguous. I, LSS and LITs are fine as products. I think for you know, Jeff Wilson often says, Buying something for 80 cents in the dollar, that's really attractive. Totally. He says this over and over again. But it's also a very you know sophisticated investment. With an unlisted fund or an ETF, you always enter and exit at NTA or NAV. Uh, if you look at all the LITs that came onto market last year, like KKR, another global <coughs> high-yield bond fund, um, it listed at 250. It's trading today at about you know 246. It's never really traded above par. It's never traded above NTA. No one's made any money at that point in time, and it can be 33% geared. So you've got potentially 33% geared global high yield. 
um, and they raised nine hundred and twenty-five million in a few days. Um, the question is: Do mums and dads really understand what they're getting into, and are the advisors being influenced by a one, two, or three percent commission? Um, at <clears throat> are these bad fund managers? No, these are great fund managers. So, first point is: Yes, LICs and LITs have a role to play. I'm not bagging the product. I completely agree on that point. Um, there's nothing wrong with LICs and LITs. I want to make that. Um, abundantly apparent. The second point is that there's nothing wrong with the fund managers in the main. A lot of them are fantastic managers. Metrics, amazing. My mum invests with metrics. But the the structure of a closed-in fund where what we know through history is that it's very easy for closed-in funds. So 75% of LITs trade below NTA and the average discount to NTA uh, at the end of last year was 9%. So it's very easy for them to trade at huge discounts. And the other lesson through history is a lot of people are saying right now to promote the new debt LITs is, oh, it's great to get um, these uh, liquid assets in the hands of mums and dads. I agree with that. You know, to get access to direct loans through managed life metrics, fantastic. I mean, that's a great diversifier. But <clears throat> you do need to also understand that when you look through the history of LICs and LITs, um, a liquid LITs, as in asset, uh, LICs and LITs that hold a liquid, not liquid assets, um, tend to trade at bigger discounts. Uh, if you look at the experience with uh, the Dixon <coughs> US Residential Masters Fund. URF. Yeah, URF. What does it hold? A liquid US houses. What's happened? Well, because it's a liquid, that means they don't trade much. It's also geared, so it's leveraged as well. So you're leveraging liquid assets like these new junk bond funds. And... Um, every once in a while, there's a dispute over, well, what's the right NTA? A few months ago or recently, suddenly Dixon, you know, lowers NTA by 30%. We saw this before the GFC. We had <coughs> high yield bond LITs with Orco Max, with Adelaide Yield Trust. There was a Hastings product. Uh, we had the private equity licks, uh, into, I think 2004, 2005. Every single one of them had problems trading at massive discounts to NTA. And the reason is, is when you hold a liquid assets in a listed fund, um, you don't often always know what the true value of those assets totally. are. And when mums and dads decide, <clears throat> it's not necessarily because it's a bad manager, it's not necessarily because they're bad assets, but when mum and dads decide that, you know what, there's a bit of uncertainty here and you know, the world's going to in, into a dark place, maybe you know there's a lot of financial market volatility and we want to get out and we don't trust NTA, suddenly you start trading at a discount to NTA and then with the liquid assets, that discount can get very, very large. So again, it's not to say that they're bad products. Um, I think there is a role in portfolios for a lot of these products. But uh, if, so the counter argument is that, so what the LICs and LITs and everyone in the industry uh, who's getting the commissions is saying, the commissions are not affecting advisors. Well, okay, so. And, and it's the search for yield dynamic that is fueling huge demand for high yielding product. That's why these things are selling like hotcakes. Okay, so. Let's do it. Let's let's try to build up the steel man argument for them because yeah. I'm always interested to know, you know, what is the best example of the argument against any given argument. So, is it really just as simple as as the the people that are saying keep commissions? Is it truly simply as commissions do not? affect outcomes and decisions. There's two arguments. One argument you hear is, well, actually, let me take a step back. Joshua Frydenberg, uh, his advisors have said to me repeatedly, so the treasurer's advisors have said that throughout this entire debate, they have not heard one person explain to them why the FOFA exemption actually exists. <clears throat> yeah, so I would agree so, with that. So, so it's actually really hard to mount, mount a case in defense of commissions. <laughs> it's not easy. Yes. You know, you're corrupting advisors. You're basically significantly raising the chance you get mis-selling crises and that consumers are getting product they don't fully understand. But the case for commissions is twofold, I think. Um, the first case is that I hear regularly are the advisors have to do work and they should be paid for their work. Yep. <clears throat> So, uh, and particularly with LICs and LITs, well, we haven't seen this product before. We've got to research and due diligence it. It could take a day or two. I want to be paid some time. And you often hear, well, I want to be paid 200 bucks per client to do the work. Obviously, you know, if you have 200 clients, it could be a lot of money. 
you know, talking about tens of thousands of dollars. So you, you hear the industry say it's only eight. We're only talking about like you know a two hundred dollar per client fee. But if you're doing the work as a one off, so you go meet KKR, you do a couple of days worth of works, <clears throat> worth of work, and then you then scale that product across hundreds of clients. Then actually you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars of commission. But I think the more basic first principle um, question is: advisors are paid to do work by their clients. Not by the fund manager. So if you have to, if you think there's a special investment opportunity <clears throat> that you think warrants a hell of a lot of extra research, then go to your clients and charge them, invoice them for the extra time. Isn't that the way the system's meant to work? That's what an accountant does. That's what a lawyer does. Your lawyer does work, you pay them more. Um, and guess what? If the client's not willing to pay you for the work, then don't do it. Why are you actually doing the work? Well, maybe it's because you want to get the commission, right? <laughs> and the other point that doesn't make sense is, um, aren't you meant to be doing that work for every other fund manager in Australia? So when you're making an SOA and you're <clears throat> building a portfolio, aren't you meant to be doing DD on all these funds? So if your logic's consistent, are you saying you need to be paid by all the funds to do DD on the entire universe? No. So that's BS. I think that argument. There is a carve out in FOFA for dealer groups and platforms, if they've got like a central compliance and surveillance function where they can actually claim back, I believe, the costs of some of that compliance work from the fund manager. So platforms charge fund managers like massive fees to list. I think BT Panorama charges us, don't quote me on this, but like $30,000 per fund per annum. Right. Yeah, which is freaking expensive. And the way they justify that, obviously it's revenue, but they claim that's compliance. So there are those those fees. Um, the second argument. So let's just say the the you know fee for work argument, as in the product manufacturer paying me to research the product manufacturer argument. <laughs> that's kind of bogus. Uh, if you want to be paid for work, get paid. I think by your client. And I think if there's a compelling case, I think smart advisors have said to me, we actually do invoice our clients for extra work. So if we've got a, um, you know, this is more in the high net worth end, um, <clears throat> there might be a, a property development opportunity. Yes. That we're going to do a hell of a lot of work on. And the advisors tell me, we just invoice our clients. So there's no wrong, nothing wrong with that. The second argument is, which I think is even more spurious, is that the commissions have no influence on the advisors. Right? Now, yeah. now let me just put this in context. You also hear a lot of furfies about how big the commissions are. Some people say they're only 1% or they're only 1.5%. Well, you know, on the recent deals or on any normal LIC, LIT, there's you know, typically three to five joint lead managers. <clears throat> there are three to five uh, dealer groups and three to five different advisors, and they are typically to pay uh, between 25 and 3% of total fees. And if you speak to the LICs, they say the advisors are paid an arranger fee, a manager fee, a distribution fee, and a stamping fee. But from the fund manager's perspective, <clears throat> they're all just one big selling fee. They're not getting anything extra, really. Um, and so this idea they're only getting paid 1%, absolute BS. Yes, some advisors are only being paid 1%, but a lot are getting one half, two, two and a half, or three. Now, then the question is, well, how big a fee is that? Well, look at real estate agents. <clears throat> the kind of dollars are similar. You know, a house is $500,000, a single advisor, uh, you know, might have 200 clients. They might put, you know, 50 into a, um, a an LIC or LIT, maybe more, and maybe they put in, you know, 30, 40, $50,000 each. But you're talking about large numbers. And a real estate agent's paid 1% to 2%, but almost always they only keep about a third to half of that <clears throat> because yep. the, the firm keeps the other half. Uh, mortgage brokers, um, you know, they're typically paid 50, 60 bips up front. Actually, just on that, one of the things you wrote was you can see how that, how, how a mortgage broker receiving commissions um, influences their work. But, uh, I've always seen it as the individual who wants to purchase a house or an investment property makes that decision and the mortgage broker facilitates the loan. How does commissions change the behavior of the mortgage broker? Well, I mean, the only thing the broker earns is the commission. Yes. So the only reason they're working is oh, for right. the commission. Right, yes, 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 so, yes, yes. So incentives are massively powerful. My point is that we have a big mortgage broking industry that's massively motivated by commissions. We have a big yes. real estate agent industry, <laughs> very spooky industry, car salesmen, real estate agents. Well, the advice space, we have worked so hard as a as a nation to move advice into a clearly unconflicted domain. Yes. Where I think advisors are respected. Yes. 
Uh, the advisors that exist today are the winners. Yes. The good advisors. Um, <clears throat> most of them are small business owners. Um, they're very ethical. They work freaking hard. Yep. Uh, and the advisors I deal with are lions. The way they defend their client interests, I don't see any. What's amazing though, I have seen advisors spruiking LICs and LITs, again, normally brokers. The dynamic is radically different. So I won't say who, <clears throat> but I was invited to an evening, a client function at one of the top brokerages in Australia and all the brokers are now advisors. And the purpose of the evening was to talk about a new LIT offering and also for me to talk about um, the beta shares HBRD ETF. And <clears throat> the way the advisors spoke about that LIT, I mean, again, it was like you were standing in a, a Toyota dealership. It was like, I just met these guys. They're amazing. We met them yesterday. They've done 14% per so- annum. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm really good mates with the fund manager. And actually, I think they invited me along for that reason because they know that. So <clears throat> I thought I was there to talk about my product. And they're asking me all these questions on the LIT. And I'm like, yeah, I love those guys. They're great mates. They're really smart dudes. And then when I was in these one-on-one environments with the advisor and the clients who were there, I mean, it was the exact opposite of what I experience in my life with advisors, that adversarial combative yeah. sort of like you're on the other side of the table yeah, and I'm second guessing and interrogating everything you're saying, Chris, um, experience just went out the window because of the commissions. Wait, so, so just piecing this in my mind, you've got a room full of... Uh, advisors and a room full of clients and the advisors are telling the clients hey how cool is this investment 100 percent. and then trying to get <laughs> that's so weird and they don't even and literally most of these guys had only met the fund manager yesterday dude like, I, the day no before. no and and they're trying to get me to speak the fund manager oh. and by the way the lit's performed horribly and uh and this is the way and the, you know you, you know it's a boiler room because if you see these LIT- It's like timeshare selling or something. Yeah, but you know it's a boiler room because these LIC and LIT book builds, and they typically raise huge bids, as in hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of bids, <clears throat> in a very, very short period of time. Now, I've raised over a billion in eight years through FOFA channels, and I know how iterative time gives me. I mean, advisors want to meet with you typically three or four times. They typically want to evaluate you over months, if not years- it, nothing happens quickly. Totally. You inject commissions into the equation. And then suddenly, <clears throat> you know, who has heard of most of these managers? Again, I don't want to name names, sure. but, but most of these managers have not raised any money in retail before. And most of these managers are um, unknown to a lot of advisors, uh, unknown to the clients. And <clears throat> they're selling complex products that it's just completely um, inconceivable they'd raise anything remotely like the same money in a FIFA environment. But here's the litmus test, the clincher, where all roads lead to is this point. <clears throat> so you say to the, the fund manager, you say to the advisor, okay, well, the commission's not having any influence, right, on the advisor. You fund manager, why don't you just stop paying the commission? If it, if it really is just a search for yield environment, if it really is driven by consumers looking for income, why are you sacrificing <clears throat> between two years and four years worth of your management fees? to pay $18 million in fees to raise $750 million. That's the latest, one of the latest offerings in the markets is paying $18.5 million in advisor fees to raise $750 million. So these fund managers are not irrational. If they could do that because the product sold itself, as it does in FOFA land, <clears throat> without commissions, of course they wouldn't be paying commissions. And we know that you can do LICs and LITs without commissions because groups like Wilson's, you know, to Jeff Wilson's credit, He's done big entitlement offers where he didn't pay commissions. And then uh, Magellan did an $863 million offer last year and they paid no commissions. Yeah. And Hamish Douglas actually wrote to me. He sent me an email. He said, Chris, this quote unquote, he said, this is a tribute to you, mate. Huh. Because I was talking to him about this issue. Yeah. And he kind of came around and said, listen, I agree with you. So <laughs> if the commissions have no impact, then the rational thing is not to pay them because it saves you a huge amount of money. Um, And the only other argument that I've heard more recently, because we've run those arguments, and obviously they're thinking of all these new counter-arguments, the final counter-argument is, which is an interesting one, is, 
oh, you have to pay commissions to get to a certain critical scale. So again, well, why does the product have to exist? Yeah. So what you're actually saying is commissions do influence outcomes. <laughs> right, it allows yeah. you to raise more money. Yeah. And the argument is, oh, these big global fund managers won't come to Australia unless they can know they, <clears throat> unless they know they can raise money. And the commission gives them that certainty. So, and, and then the argument is that with the debt LITs, you want bigger LITs because they'll be more liquid, right? But look what's happened with KKR. That's the biggest debt LIT we've ever seen. It listed 925 million bucks. Um, again, 33% geared junk bond fund. It listed in November at 250. It's traded down to 241. I don't think it's ever been above 250. NTA is 254. And, you know, this week it's been trading at, you know, 245. So it's this big, supposedly liquid LRT has not been trading well at all. And it's never traded above its issue price and it's never consi- consistently traded above NTA. So actually what we know about in economics is that the laws of supply and demand are inviolable. And if you have too much supply, <clears throat> prices will fall if given finite demand. So actually what you tend to see is that you issue too much of this product with too many commissions and you create too much size, they tend to perform poorly. And ironically, it's actually the equity LIC guys and LIT guys that are starting to come out of the woodwork. So we've had Paul Moore PM Capital say, <clears throat> this this stuff is that commissions have to go. They're toxic time bombs. We've had Hamish Douglas at Magellan, who paid lots of commissions for lots of uh, LIT product, come out and say, you know, basically this is a huge problem. We've had the forager guys come out and say, you know, this is a huge problem. So, I mean, Morningstar did this fascinating survey recently, and I think they found that 80% of advisors think that commissions uh, are incompatible with FIFA and shouldn't exist, and almost 90% of investors thought that. But tellingly, they also found, I think, 65% of advisors said that they did not feel they could satisfy their best interest duty if they were paid a commission, and only like 30% thought they could. You know, everyone knows what the answer here is. The commission needs to go. It's just a question of whether the coalition... Is it going to be able to make the right decision? Because Labor's jumped on the bandwagon. You know, Labor's thumping the table, saying, "You know, we've got to protect the sanctity of FIFA." What would you say is percentage <laughs> of the advisor market are recommending these LICs? In or like, uh, let's say there's twenty thousand advisors. How many of these are actually receiving these commissions? So we know this from the Morningstar survey that 17% say that they're taking the commissions. And then I think a further, um, I'm going to get this number wrong, but uh, slightly less than another circa 10% uh, say that sometimes they take the commissions. Okay. Uh, and it, I, my experience is that they're quite, there's a, a small cohort of investors, uh, sorry, advisors. So say 5 to 10% that have clipped the ticket in the past, you know, went into L1, classic case. So L1 was this huge LIT, you know, three, four times levered hedge fund. And they said they were targeting six, seven hundred million. <clears throat> the commissions that got got them one point three five billion in demand, so they're massively upside. So it's one point three five billion. It's an equity uh, hedge fund LIT, and then it traded like down fifty percent within six months. It was a disaster, and I think a lot of advisors got burnt on that. So I think you have like five to ten percent that might have taken commissions in the past, but don't right now. And then you have got fifteen to twenty percent that are still actively clipping the ticket and taking commissions. Um, I will say there's a lot of advisors who rebate the commissions to their clients, but yep. equally there are advisors who don't. Sure. Um, and the point is we don't even want this debate. Yeah, no, it's, it, seem, it seems like the, the point of the conversation has shifted a lot if that's the conversation that's having. So essentially if I, like from where I'm sitting, you've got 15 to 20% of advisors are still taking commissions, 85 uh, to 80% of advisors are not taking these commissions. There's a huge imbalance in terms of what uh, that small subsection of advisors can offer to their clients at a, a discount on advisor fees, whereas the majority of advisors uh, are paying are needing to charge more fees in, in, in order to stay profitable at this stage due to all the different changes in regulation. Um, so just, that- on that, just on that point as well, this is also, you know, the start of the tsunami. So we've seen an LIC, LIT tsunami. The industry has doubled in size to over 52 billion. But we knew coming into 2020, there were 20 to 30 new LICs and LITs in the pipeline because every fund manager on earth has seen that 
a no-name manager comes to Australia, gets $1.5 billion a bid. Well, this is the best way to raise capital. <laughs> yeah, for two times levered junk bonds, and he's charging high fees and maybe performance fee. Every fund manager on earth is like, I need to explore that loophole. Yeah, 100%. So, so what we're seeing, yes, only maybe, say, circa 20% of advisors are taking commissions. But the, as more and more managers come to market, um, <clears throat> eventually more and more advisors will be sucked into uh, this vortex of conflicts and 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 so there'll be more and more pressure on the ethical and conflicted advisors <laughs> to basically do a deal with the devil and dance <laughs> on the pale moon light. Mate, I'm just sitting here thinking like, imagine if the result of FOFA was was eventually just, hey, use LICs. <laughs> imagine. Well, imagine. FOFA, so FOFA captured, so the thing, another interesting point is that LICs and LICs were captured by FOFA from 2012 to 2014. And I said to Jeff Wilson, did it have any impact? And he goes, oh, I can't really recall any impact. As in the industry was fine. I mean, they weren't doing massive offerings because they couldn't because they couldn't pay huge commissions. The truth is if you're a really good fund manager and you've got a compelling opportunity, you will be able to raise money on the ASX through an LIC and LIT without paying commissions. Absolutely. I, I think Magellan's done it. Uh, Wilson's done it through entitlement offers. I think Metrics could do it if it wanted to. But it's still going to be hard because advisors are not stupid. They're going to say, well, I'm not getting a commission and you can trade at a discount to NTA. My clients don't like that. There's illiquidity. With an ETF or an unlisted fund, I always get NTA. Um, so you're going to have to be really fucking good in order to do that. Yeah. So to me, it seems like keeping these around is simply going to force more advisors to start using these vehicles. Yeah, from, from our conversation, I still don't understand why this was introduced post fofa anyway nobody does i've i've got a i've got a a strange inkling that facio is going to have a, a massive problem with this regardless of fofa yeah so facio is interesting though and facio is another battleground a similar battleground so with facio um, and everyone i'm sure is familiar with facio the, the the code of ethics is the legally binding part Correct. of facio yeah, yeah that's that's very high yeah and the code of ethics so that's the legally binding language and then the guidance note is not legally binding so if it goes to court if you're sued by a client mm. the guidance note is not really worth the paper it's written on no no yeah it's just it's an interp- it's like a um, in asic world the corporations act is the law yes and then asic issues a regulatory guide that yes. says this is how you should interpret it but it is quite common <clears throat> for the courts to say, ASIC, your regulatory guide's wrong. The sure. law actually means this. Um, and the problem with FASIA's code of ethics is it was drafted by lawyers who are tough lawyers and it's really like it set a very high bar. Yeah. Um, but you can see that the conflicted advisors are looking for loopholes and kind of finding loopholes. In FASIA, <clears throat> the guidance note offers lots of loopholes, right? Um, and I think that's a battleground where, you know, effectively all the vested interests. I mean, the LIC has waged war against me personally on this. Again, I've lost clients. They've been bashing me reputationally. This, this hired, is an association, right, that now exists? Well, yeah, they created their own industry lobby group called LICAT, L-I-C-A-T. And <laughs> they assumed everyone would want to be a member. And then when Magellan found out what they were doing, Magellan actually withdrew yeah. because of the way they were behaving, as did VGI. Um, and then they hired a, a guy that has long been an advocate for LICs as a product, a guy called Dominic McCormick, um, to write on their behalf. And lo and behold, he started smashing me in quite personal attacks, like saying, he said, oh, this guy's apparently a mate with ScoMo, so he must be a dickhead, basically. And things like that. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> firstly, I'm bashing the coalition. They hate my guts right now. <laughs> Secondly, I'm aligned with Labor on this. Thirdly, what do my politics have to do with, you know, the price of eggs in China? I mean, that's just ridiculous. Totally. And, um, but, but apparently the Lycat lobby group went to every LIC <clears throat> operator in Australia and said, we each need you to give us $10,000 because we've got to get Chris Joy. We're going to go to slam Chris Joy. And apparently they had this offsite where they said, listen, we can't win the policy debate. We, there's no intellectual defensible arguments really in favor of this. We're going to play the man, not the ball. So they've been <clears throat> personally attacking me very vigorously. I heard from a journalist that um, they've hired also uh, a, a lobbyist called, I think his name is David Gizzard, and he's one of ScoMo's best mates. And the lobbyist said to a journal, oh, you know, Chris Joy, he's been – 
really good in public policy and he's really kind of helped governments and yeah, I respect him for that. But you know that he tried to get an LIC up and failed. That's why he's against this, which is absolute bullshit. I can swear on my son's life. We have never lifted a finger to try and get an LIC up. We've been approached many times. We've always said no. Where and I run inf- the fastest growing active ETF in Australia. So it makes no sense. Where, with that information, it always cracks me up when just, w- would there be a public record if you'd tried to start an LIC? Yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you'd lodge a prospectus with ASIC. And- right. And, and <laughs> does that exist? Obviously, fucking not. That's ridiculous. Well, well, well how I, can someone just say that then? Because, mate, they've made up lots of lies. They said that, um, you know, uh, because I have a minority of my portfolios in hybrids that we're conflicted. Uh, but the, the irony in all of this is I distribute through the same advisors that are clipping the tickets. Yes. They all hate my guts right now and they've pulled funds from us. Only on Friday we were threatened uh, to have our funds removed from an APL from one of the biggest players in this space because of our position. Um, <clears throat> and they're, 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 every time I ever get in any policy debate over the last 25 years, people will always try and dredge up conflicts, particularly if they have no ground to stand on, right? Sure. Um, but, but, you know, we, we've, you know, I'm, I'm running four and a half billion today. We're one of the fastest growing credit managers in Australia. It would be dead easy for us. To, I could raise vast amounts of money through an LRC. And we only in December last year, one of the biggest brokers in the land approached me and said, would you be keen to do this? So it, that's absolute BS. They just, and they know it. But, you know, I'm kind of like Darth Vader to those guys, unfortunately. But thankfully, you know, Hamish Douglas has come out, Paul Moore PM's come out, the Forager guys have come out. And I'm comforted, and I guess I'm I'm fortified by I've been overwhelmed by advisors on our on my LinkedIn page. You know the Will Hamiltons of the world, who's on Fazia's board. Uh, he's appointed by the government. I mean, he's been muzzled by the government, but he's he's been very strong in speaking out on these issues. Um, and I've had sc- hundreds and hundreds of advisors write to me and just say, Chris, we really appreciate the work you've done highlighting these conflicts of interest. We think it gives us a bad name. We want the issue to go away. One thing I would say is that the Treasury, so Josh Frydenberg has announced this inquiry into the issue and it closes on the 20th, um, which is tomorrow, um, and they're calling for submissions. So if you're an advisor listening to this and it's resonating with you, the, the issues, and you're worried about what you're hearing, you can go to the Commonwealth Treasury's website and if you just Google stamping fees, exemption, Treasury, you'll see that the page... And you can email them a submission. It can only be one page and or two pages, but you could literally just write down a page saying, I'm XYZ advisor. I really run a fee-for-service or asset-based fee practice where I only get paid by my client. I don't accept kickbacks from fund managers. I think the notion of you know fund managers paying kickbacks to advisors to push product is absolutely diabolical and it's going to pollute my industry. Um, <clears throat> my competitors are going to start cutting their advice fees, subsidizing them with commissions, um, and it's going to destroy all the good work we've done since FIFA, and it's going to kill FIFA because that's what's happening. Yeah, that- and I, I would I would just strongly encourage any advisors guys if you're listening, just even if it's a few paragraphs, PDF it up and fire it into Treasury. I close the business on the 20th or even if it comes in late that's fine for me sitting here it's like if you're going to have commissions just have commissions like Correct. don't limit it to LIC so I, I, I'm I'm of the view that we shouldn't have commissions but it kind of seems from a really really straightforward rational point of view that if you're going to have commissions you have commissions if you don't have commissions you don't have commissions. Correct. It yeah. just it, it and, and and to carve out one financial instrument. Why? I just can't figure that. It's it's <clears throat> it, all it's going to do, at least to my mind, is cause people to go down that. Now let's assume for a moment that Frydenberg doesn't overturn this. Let's assume for a moment that LICs continue being able to pay a a commission. Let's assume that. Um, advisors go from 15% of advisors, let's say, goes up to 50%. Would you, would Hamish, would, would Coolabar and Magellan, would you guys start using them? Would Because you'd almost be, you would almost be forced to. Yeah, I mean, if it becomes, you know, the original question is why was this exemption created in the first place? Uh, Corman in 2014 wanted to be able to allow vertically integrated advisors to get sales bonuses to push in-house product. <laughs> he got beaten down on that. And I think this was a little bit of payback. You know, there was this little loophole that he left in that he negotiated afterwards that nobody noticed. And it's just created this kind of Frankensteinian monster. But the truth is, if they leave the law in place, 
yes, like, uh, you know, we'll be threatened with irrelevance totally. if we don't offer a product um, in that domain. Like our, yes. as a fund manager, my focus is to offer uh, products in every channel my clients want them. Yep. So we have ETS, we have unlisted funds, we have customized mandates. Uh, you know, 70% of my money comes from Insta investors, super funds, universities, charities, et cetera. Um, and <laughs> if the client base wants a LIC or LIT, you know, we can provide that. And if the only way to do that is by paying commissions, because that's what the um, uh, you know, industry standard is, then we'll pay commissions. But to be honest, I really, really <coughs> don't want to go down that path. One argument the industry is saying is, oh, cap the commission at 1% or maybe 0.5%. But we see that you know whether it's a mortgage broker earning 0.6 percent, whether it's a real estate agent getting one percent, I mean that's a still an immensely powerful incentive, particularly in these straightened times where advisors are not earning a great deal of money. It's hard to get um, uh, generate earnings on, on a fee for service basis. That's an important thing because this is not a question around whether you're a good person or a good advisor or a bad person or a bad advisor the question is simply around motivation and it's simply around following um the path that is created by the government and i Correct. and and so i'm with you like uh, my view is that if you want to have commissions they should be on everything yes I personally ethically have a really like i think you, you're just going to create yet another round of mis-selling crises it just it, it, but if it, you're not going to have commissions which was the whole point of folk in the first place <laughs> you just get rid of them, yeah. and there's no Trojan commissions. A hundred percent. That's a really good word to use, Trojan commissions, because either have it or don't have it, and it doesn't make you. It, it's not like if there's advisors out there that are taking it. It's it's it's. I don't think it actually reflects onto them as a person or not. I think they're just simply abiding by what the rules and regulations are. But from the government's point of view, they just need to make a decision: Are you in or are you out? Did we go through all this like? It's been appalling. Like from the advisor's point of view, everything that's happened to, you know, from FOFA and pre-FOFA through to FASIA and the Royal Commission, the whole, like, there's just so much there. And I think on that note, like writing for the AFR, it kills me. And I've written to journalists saying, you know, you guys are uh, slamming advisors all the time. It's been horrible. It's horrible. But And I, I, so I deal with these guys at the coalface. And ninety nine percent are fucking smart, yes. fucking hardworking, yes. And they're lions. They 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 rapidly de- defend their 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 pride, which yes. is their clients. And I think there's this tiny, tiny, long tail that wags. And unfortunately, that's the the tail wagging the dog, which is you know obviously the corrupt um, or conflicted advisors. And to your point about like intent, I think a lot of advisors rebate these commissions. <laughs> a lot of, most advisors don't take these commissions, as we know. Even the guys that do take them. I think you know, their heart is in the right place and they are actually working diligently to try and act in their client's best interest. So I'm not saying those guys are dodgy. Totally. But there are also other advisors that are taking the commissions and recommending the products only because of the commissions. I've actually had those guys also contact me. Sure. I've had a, um, a client of mine who, <coughs> lovely guy, really smart guy, advisor, was a broker, now an advisor, say to me, listen, Joy Manator, he <laughs> rang me and he said, he rang me the other day and he said, listen, Joy Manator, Dude, I understand you're a dog with a bone, but find another bone, please. I said, well, what's the problem? He goes, well, I'll admit I've taken commissions and I'll admit I feel guilty taking those commissions. And I'll also admit that those commissions influence the recommendations I made. But every time you write about this stuff, it caused me grief with my clients and you know he's actually having to repay his commissions. Uh, to his clients yeah, so on we, the basis of products that have performed tough. poorly. So, and he's a good bloke. He's a smart, very smart guy. And he's a classic case of, I think, the Charlie Munger, uh, maxim that show me an incentive. I'll show you an outcome. Totally. He, he kind of realizes he maybe made some bad choices, but his point was there are much bigger issues. There's, you know, white collar crime. Uh, there are much bigger problems that ASIC should be sinking its teeth into. Uh, my concern is this is tip of the iceberg stuff, as in, you know, the sector's doubled in size now to 52 billion. There's 20 to 30 managers lining up to hit the <clears throat> market again. And the whole industry is effectively going to be engulfed in this problem. So we need to kill it now while we can. Yeah. So in closing, realistically, uh, I don't want to see advisors have gone through the last decade only to lift open the latch again and to start the cycle again. That, that It's just there's too much effort, too much hard work, too much shame too much dragging through the mud. There's a whole 
like, it, I mean, we've had advisors that have killed themselves, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's there's been too much sacrifice, it's too much rapid change to get to the end. Yeah. Right? So we've, we've been whipped. We've been the public whipping post for so long. And then to say, but there's more to come. I just, yeah. I can't, I just, I can't, I can't yeah, see I th- how advisors can put up with any more. I agree. And it, and it just, it's either you're in, you're either, either, either commissions from investment products is gone or they're not. Yeah. And I think that that's why this halfway house that we're currently in, where there's this huge um, back door or, or, you know, you can Trojan horse your way into massive commissions has to be eliminated. And, you know, I think the, the, I actually think the advice industry is one of the best professions in Australia in terms of the I quality, agree. in terms of the quality of the industry and the, um, <clears throat> the quality of the people I met. I'm actually, it just constantly amazes me how many smart advisors there are out there, like really smart. These aren't, these aren't, I think a lot of the duds and the dregs, uh, I don't come across them, but I think they were washed out of the industry over the last, uh, decade or two. Um, and, Again, if you feel strongly about this, send in a, a one-page commentary to Treasury as soon as you can, just saying it is of paramount importance. We have unconflicted advice, and we don't have a two-class system. We don't have some advisors who can subsidize the cost of advice by taking huge fees from fund managers and other advisors who want to do the best thing. Um, I do think that it feels like we're kind of hopefully um, scaling the crest of this regulatory and reputational war that advisors have faced. Yes. Like in respect to Fazia, I think the tenor of feedback I'm getting from advisors is starting to change a little. You know, it's gone from, oh, my God, we've got all this regulation to, <clears throat> I've done my FASIA exams. Um, you know, FASIA is actually good for the industry. Um, you know, the funny thing about FASIA is I think it's mostly good. One thing an advisor pointed out to me the other day is it creates problems with asset-based fees. I'm actually a big fan of asset-based fees for advisors. Well, naturally. <laughs> well, yeah, that's my – but as a fund manager, obviously I charge asset-based yes. fees. But I've – like my mum, her advisor charges her – Chunky asset base fees, and I'm I'm all for that because you see it as a advisor wins if the client wins. Correct. I, I've said to advisors, I'd be very cool and keen to see advisors have performance fees as well. I'd rather a lower asset base fee, mm. and then you know you you basically agree risk limits with the clients. Yep. So you can't just dial up the risk to get totally. the performance fees. Yep. But they have a return expectation. If the advisor can create wealth, I think the advisor should be rewarded through that wealth creation. I'm actually not. Frankly, such a great fan of um, I, 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 I what fees for service. I just worry it dulls the incentive to go the extra mile. Um, yeah, look, I, I think the, the idea of fixed no, fees. There, there is really no <laughs> golden, um, you know, solution. Exactly, and yeah. so it's it's so much. I mean, I was speaking to a very good advisor yesterday, and he was he was he's actually my first ever boss in the industry, and uh, he said, you know, Fasio hasn't. Um, blown up my business at all because I've been doing annual opt-in since 09, right? Yeah. For example, and he was obviously university educated and he was a tax accountant. And um, the thing about FASIA is it's it it has done more good than bad. Than bad, yeah. So on the asset base fee, this advisor said to me, so on a literal interpretation of FASIA, I've got a client who comes to me and he says, um, you know, I've got a million bucks in, in cash. Um, if I recommend that he puts that with us and I charge an asset base fee, don't I have a conflict of interest? And, you know, I, I guess on a literal interpretation of FASIA, <clears throat> that might be the conclusion. I think that does need to be ironed out. I think that as long as the client is paying the fees, I would like to see advisors have a lot of flexibility and creativity totally. in terms of how they engineer that relationship. Totally. I'd love to see asset-based fees, fixed fees, additional fees for additional work or research that the advisor does, performance fees. I'm a supporter of all of that. I don't think there should be any limit on how the client pays the advisor. Yeah, that's a it's a weird it's a weird thing to even Correct. attempt to do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and that that's a big problem, I think. If 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 it is a problem, I'm not an expert on this, but if it is a problem, I think that's a big uh, big problem. But I also equally believe that we're very very close to attaining a new gold standard uh, reputationally for advisors in Agreed. Australia. And the last thing in the world we want to do is contaminate that or pollute that. Um, with a new conflict scandal. Totally. And look, and if brokers want to earn money uh, through commissions, go for it. But just don't get called and 
Pfizer while doing it. That's correct. So this is another solution. I mean, uh, someone I've been thinking about this, and someone also has said something similar to me that. You know, maybe if you want to sell stuff, you're just a broker. Totally. And there's nothing wrong with that. The vital part of the ecosystem. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. You can be a mortgage broker. Or, yes. Or I don't know how it works. Like all the stockbrokers seem to be becoming advisors. Maybe some of those guys should stay brokers and not be advisors. Yeah. I think one of the problems there is their firms want them to become advisors. And um, you know, there may be compliance requirements to be uh, RG146 qualified. Uh, but yeah, I think that that advice brand needs to be pure as driven snow. I also think that you know, maybe there's a case, um, I mean, obviously, if Frydenberg eliminates the commissions, the problem goes. Totally. Um, and I think there's a good chance he'll do that, but I think it's up in the air, which is why you know anyone who's listening should make a submission. But if he doesn't eliminate the commissions, and I think FASIA should um, produce a new accreditation for advisors who are unconflicted and don't take kickbacks from investment product manufacturers. Because you should be able to put on your business card, your email address, and your website that I'm a commission-free advisor. Because the problem is the dudes who are taking the commissions and charging lower fees, they're not going to disclose the fact they're taking commissions to the client when the clients are reviewing them initially, right? Sure, you know, six months down the track when they're doing the SOA and they're recommending a portfolio chock-a-block full of LITs, they're going to say, oh, and by the way, we are paid a commission. But when, you know, the client's looking at advisor A versus advisor B, uh, and advisor A is you know, charging twice the rate of advisor B. Uh, advisor B is not going to be volunteering the information that, oh, one of the reasons I'm much cheaper is because I get huge commissions. Down the line. Absolutely. Mate, thank you so much for coming on. It's been really good for me to learn. Um, I didn't, like I said, I didn't know a lot about this sort of stuff. So to get someone like you to come on and explain, it's been fantastic. If there are advisors that would like to reach out for any reason whatsoever, how would they get in contact with you? Yeah. So, um, you can email me at Christopher.joy, J-O-Y-E at coolabarcapital.com. That's C-O-O-L-A-B-A-H, capital.com, not dot A-U. Um, we have our own podcast, which is the, compl- well, called Complexity Premium. Uh, that's available on iTunes or uh, Podbean. And then our website's just coolabarcapital.com. And I'm always happy to talk to folks anytime, 24 seven. I'd just actually like to say to anyone listening, <coughs> thank you to all the amazing advisors out there um, for working so hard on behalf of your clients. Um, also, to the extent that any investors of mine are listening, thanks for your support, guys. Um, and, and Clayton, well done to you for you know, producing this product because it's awesome. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.